Hello, this is Scott Dahman of Power World Corporation. In this session, we will learn how to edit and analyze an existing power flow case, and also how to build one line diagrams from existing cases. Power World simulator cases can be created from text based power flow formats such as the PTI RAW file or the GE PSLF file. These formats are commonly used with NERC cases and cases that are developed from ISOs and market operators. The data that comes with the typical power flow case includes a static model of the power system. It includes generator information, bus information, transmission lines, etc. The topology of the case. For some studies the model and the information that's in the case is sufficient, but other times you might need to augment the model with things like generator cost information, detailed reactive power capability curves, uh, other options that are available in Power World Simulator, interfaces, injection groups, etc. And we're going to learn about each of these things in later parts of the training. So typically the procedure that you might go through would be to open a power flow case from a text-based source. You might create or edit a one-line diagram using the graphic interface that we discussed in the first training session. You might augment the data with some supplemental information such as, such as generator cost models or reactive power capability curves. And then you can save the work in a binary file in the Power World simulator format or the PWB format. And from there you might perform advanced studies uh, using tools like contingency analysis, available transfer capability, optimal power flow, and several others. When you're finished doing your work in Power World Simulator, you then might choose to export the data into back into a text-based format such as a PTI RAW file or an EPC file. The information represented in a text file power flow case is a single system model of the power system. In Power World Simulator you can always edit uh, what we call case information displays or spreadsheet like uh, displays of the text for each of the object types in the in the case. You can also create one line diagrams and these are distinct from the power flow data itself. Multiple one lines can be created and then used with different power flow cases. Power World Simulator has several different tools for the user to interact with the power flow model and with the displays. The user can open pre-generated bus view one line diagrams or the user can create a one line diagram and edit mul up multiple one line diagrams with a single case. And then you can also view the information in the case in text displays which again we call the case information display. And then the case data itself uh, exists down here and of course then the user can interact with the case in many different ways. Even within a single one-line diagram, the relationship between the objects that you see on the one-line diagram, like buses and transmission lines, is not necessarily a one-to-one -one mapping to the underlying system model. You can have multiple objects on the one-line linked to a single object in the system model. This is a pretty powerful approach, but it can introduce some ambiguity when deleting objects. And we'll look at the options that the user has in just a little bit. The user can delete just the object on the display or when the user chooses to delete the object on the display, you can also select to delete the underlying model object as well. In this next example, we're going to build a partial one-line diagram from a case that models the American Midwest in a PTI format. We're going to open it from the PTI format and then add some buses, uh, transmission lines, and loads to the one-line diagram. 
So at this point we'll switch over to simulator and we will use the application button to open the case. In simulator we go up to the upper left hand corner, click the application button and then select open case. From here we'll want to select files of type PTI raw data and then select the case midwest.raw. If you haven't already done so, you can download this case from the web training section of our website as well. So once you have the case, you can click on it and then select open. And the message log tells us as it's reading in the different object types from the case. It says that no default one-line display exists. Would you like to create one? Select yes. To view a text description of this case, we can select the case information ribbon and then click case description. And a window will pop up with just a text description of the case which the user can enter and change if you want. The PTI format allows two lines for this text. In a simulator PWB format, you can enter as many lines as you would like. More information about the case can be found in the case summary, which is also available under the case information ribbon. So if we click case summary, we will see information like how many buses, generators, and loads, and so forth are in the case. There's also totals for the load and the generation in the case, as well as information about where the system slack bus is located. Power World Simulator allows for several different ways of filtering data that you see in the PowerFlow case. For this case, we're going to open on the Case Information ribbon tab the Area Zone Filters. And I'm going to get the log out of the way too here so that we can see more of what's on the screen. We can use these filters to show just certain control areas certain zones or certain owners. And then everything that we look at in the case in other displays will only show objects that meet that filter. In this case we want to set a filter that shows only the objects in the Illinois power area. So to do that I'm going to first change the shown column for every area to no and then I'll go back and just select Illinois Power and change it to yes. So to change everything to no, right click in the shown column on any of the uh, the yes lines that are in there. Then select set toggle columns and then toggle all no. This sets everything on the display to know. Then I'm going to scroll down and find Illinois Power. Oh, it's actually on the 16th line, area number 57. If I select that cell where it says shown for area 57, Illinois Power, and double click it, that'll toggle it to yes. Now I can close the dialog. Other things that are shown on the Area Zone Owner Filters dialog are the total number of buses that are in each area, as well as the minimum and maximum bus number that is assigned to the bus in each respective area. Power World Simulator also includes a couple of text displays intended for compatibility with the look and feel of uh, PSSE. One of these is what's called the PowerFlow list, and this will show complete information 
for all the buses with the area zone owner filter set to yes. And to reach this display, we go to the case information ribbon again and then select power flow list. So I'll switch back over to simulator in case information then click power flow list. And it basically shows the generation, the load, and then the branches, and then the power flowing into and out of that bus. And then of course in this display I can scroll down to see the other buses that meet the area zone owner filters. And I can also right click inside the display and it's got a set of local menu options. Simulator also has what's called the Quick Power Flow List. And with the Quick Power Flow List, you can enter a bus number or a range of numbers to display the Power Flow List data. So, for example, I could type in a bus number, say 32353, and then click Show Buses, and it'll show that bus. And you can also type in a range of buses as well. And for the quick power flow list, the area zone owner filters are not used. It will basically display whichever buses you tell it to display. So again, you can enter a single bus or a range with dashes, or you can use a comma to separate different items in the list as well. Simulator also includes what we call the bus view one line diagram. And this is basically a graphical representation of the power flow list. It's intended to replace the quick power flow list. It's easier to use and it allows you to navigate through the buses in the system kind of like web pages by clicking on additional buses. So to get to it, we'll go to the One Lines ribbon tab and then click Bus View. So from here you can enter a bus number just like we do on the Quick Power Flow list. So for example, I could type in 32353 and hit Enter again. And this will show me a graphical representation. So from here, I can click on any bus that I see connected. Again, I'm back on the ADM North bus, 32353, and it shows me all the transmission lines and its neighbors, as well as any load or generation connected to the bus. State information is also displayed, such as the per unit voltage magnitude, the absolute voltage magnitude in in KV, the angle, and the locational marginal price of power at that bus, assuming that the optimal power flow has been solved and those values have been computed. That will be discussed in a later training session. But anyway, I can click on buses that I see that are connected to it, and the display will switch to show those buses. If I don't know exactly which bus I want to call up, I can also use the search for option and that will bring up another dialog which will show all the buses in the case. I can sort it by bus number or I can sort it by name and I can just start to type. And as I type it will jump to the first match that matches the string that I type in. I can also use wildcard characters such as the asterisk to represent any string of any length or the question mark which represents a single placeholder, a single character placeholder for locating the, uh, the string. So for example I could type in B O star and it'll jump to the first match. 
once I have my string in, I can also repeatedly enter the enter key and it will jump to the next match and just cycle through. I can also restrict what's in the list to show only those buses that meet the area zone filters. Then once I've selected my bus from this list, I can click OK, and then the bus view online diagram bounces back to that bus. Similar to a web browser, the bus view online also has back buttons, which can take you back to the last bus displayed, or forward buttons, and then a drop down list as well to show all the history, all the buses that have been visited since the bus view online has been open. The colors of the buses in the bus view online are determined by the default drawing values. And these were discussed in the last training session uh, series of slides. So in this example right here we can see that it's using a multi KV scheme, color scheme whereby the 230 kV buses are shown in blue and different voltages are shown in different colors. The symbols on the one lines on the buses that are not the active bus will also reveal whether or not there is generation, load, or shunts at those buses. You can also interact with the one line diagram such as the circuit, things like the circuit breakers like we did in the previous session as well, where by clicking them we'll open the transmission line. There's also an options menu which allows you to change some things about the appearance of the one line diagram. If I click on it I'll see first of all the number of tiers and this basically shows how many tiers of neighbors from the current bus are shown on the one line. If I change it to 2, for example, then from this bus right here, I see its immediate neighbor, and then I see its neighbors, two neighbors as well. And several of these other options on the options menu are described on the slide here. If you tell it to show serial buses, then buses that are directly in series with no other taps will be cascaded. Uh, this is pretty common in multi-section lines that are seen in the western part of North America, for example, where you might have a series capacitor in series with the transmission line and then perhaps another series capacitor at the other end. You have the option of showing or hiding equivalent lines and these are lines that are not actual part of the power system but are were created as an equivalent construct. You can select to represent multi-section line objects as a multi-section line or as individual lines. So showing it as a multi-section line will hide the individual elements without the intermediate buses. And then you can also choose to open multiple bus views so that when you go to the menu, to the, uh, to the ribbon rather, to select uh, a new bus view, uh, will it open a new window entirely or will it just change the view on the existing bus view? So there's a couple different options there. And then a couple other options are given here too for including field labels or changing the color of the bus link. The bus view one line also has a couple of presets in it where you can define the fields that are shown on the bus view one line. We'll talk about the custom view next. There are two predefined views as well, the input data view and the system state view. So the input data view shows things like the impedance on branches, input parameters. Whereas the system state view shows things like angle and magnitude at buses, basically the system state. 
And if custom views are de defined, then they will appear at the bottom of this list. Let me switch over to simulator to show that. So here's the views menu. If I click that, I can see that what I'm on right now is the system state view. I can change it to the input data view as well. And then instead of showing the system state, it shows things like the line impedances on the branches and then things like the bus bus number and the voltage and the, the nominal KV uh, which again is input data when you create the case. I can also click on views and then tell it I want to define a custom view and then when you do this you've got some placeholders whereby you can select which fields are shown by each object type on the bus view one line. So the bus view one line can show generators, loads, and shunts directly attached to the bus. Shown in bold are the fields that will be shown in the custom bus view one line. If I want to modify it, I can just click modify, or first select a field rather. So if I want to uh, add a new field, there's a placeholder for that right here where it says one in parentheses and then choose. And then if I click modify, I can select a new field. This brings up a dialog that's very similar to the dialog that came up in the previous section when we were adding fields to the one line. So for example, I could tell it to put the generator's AGC status on the, the view and then click OK and then it shows up right here. If I want to change some fields that are already on there, I can select a field that's on there and tell it that I want to modify the field. That'll give me the option to change the field to a different field. Or if I just don't want the field on there at all, I can select it and then click Remove. And I can basically do the same thing for loads, shunts, buses, transmission lines, the neighbor buses, and so forth. And if I want, I can give it a name as well. I can click the Save down here, and I'll just call it uh, My Bus View, and then click OK. And then when I'm done, I can click Switch to Custom Bus View. And of course, in this case, the only thing I changed was on a generator display. So I'll have to actually go through here and find a generator. Looks like there's one at the Baldwin bus which is 32274. You could just type this in directly up here if you like. 32274 and then hit enter. And I can see too, I'm going to have to scroll uh, down here by by clicking on the background and dragging. Uh, this is basically just like any other one line so the same tools that we used for example, in the prior session for navigating the one line can be used here as well. So I can see that with these generators, I've got the AGC on field here. And then if I click on the views, I can see that the uh, custom view has been added to the list. And so again, I can switch among the predefined views or the custom view that I created as well. So the slide shows a summary here of the input data view and the system state view and the different fields that show up with each. And then the custom view, which is shown here. And again, you can choose which objects that you want to show on your custom view. At this point, let's try to solve our power flow case so that we can get the system state and all the flows. I'll switch back over to Power World Simulator and then I'll open my message log from the quick access toolbar up here. I can just float the mouse over these buttons, remember, uh, to see what they what they do in case I've forgotten what they do. So I'll open the log and then I'll resize it a little bit and then I'll go back up to the top to the quick access toolbar and click the solve 
case icon. And as it's doing that, it's going through and adjusting a bunch of tap changing transformers to make sure that they're regulating uh, to the uh, proper set points. And we can see that it did find a solution. When you tell Simulator to solve the case, it will automatically switch to the run mode for you at that point. Uh, this particular case had some initial mismatches because of voltage truncation and also in raw files you might see that the uh, case has some mis mismatches due to buses being merged internally in PSSE. Power World Simulator does not merge buses even if they have low impedance branches separating them. So these mismatches should go away in just a few iterations. So in addition to the bus view one lines which we've already looked at, we can build our own one line diagram to use with this case. In addition, we can interact with the case using the text displays which we'll look at more in the next session. But certainly for visualization, the one line diagram provides a lot of powerful tools. So we will want to build a one line diagram of part of the system. Uh, it's important to note that the one line diagrams don't need to be created for the entire system. You can actually simulate the system without any one line diagrams or you can create a one line diagram that includes only the part of the system of interest. So PowerWorld Simulator in the background is always modeling the entire system and performing all of the calculations. But typically, uh, you're only interested in visualizing part of the system, so you only need to create a partial one-line diagram. And Simulator, as you build the one-line diagram, will link that diagram that you're building to the existing PowerFlow model that is open and loaded in memory. As in the previous training session, when we want to edit a one-line diagram, we do need to switch to edit mode. Simulator provides some built-in tools for automatically inserting borders, which we'll use here. Back in Simulator, I'll first switch over to edit mode by clicking the edit mode button. And then I'm going to close my message log and minimize the uh, bus view one line to show my blank one line where we'll draw our new objects. I'll click on the draw tab and then from the draw ribbon choose auto insert and then borders. From here I can see built-in borders which we have for states and counties as well in the United States, Canadian provinces, and continents for and, and other regions for the rest of the world. Since this is a US model, I'll go back to the United States tab and I'm just going to go ahead and insert borders for all of the continental US which are shown right here. Hawaii and Alaska are shown separately. If you want to insert those, you can use the checkbox here. So basically to get all of the continental US, I'll just choose select all. And then I want to go to my options tab as well. If I want to adjust things like the line thickness or the color or background fill and so forth, I can do that here. So I'm going to change the thickness from one to two and I'm also going to make the color black for the state boundaries. And then I'll choose OK. By default, it's going to put the borders on a new layer that it calls borders. Again, these are the screen layers that we discussed in the previous training session. So I'll go back to the Power World Library tab again and then before I select OK, the last thing I can choose is the map projection. And Simulator supports two different map projections. One is a conic projection, which is suitable really only for North America. 
Uh, basically, it's going to put the North Pole at an imaginary point at the top of the diagram and then just project uh, longitude lines down from the North Pole. So latitude lines will appear curved. But again, it only really works for North America because of the way the projection is drawn. If you bring in other regions, uh, they'll appear rather distorted. We can also use the Mercator projection, which uses basically a constant size rectangle to represent each of the degrees of latitude and longitude. So latitude lines will appear horizontal and things that are closer to the poles will appear a little bit distorted. They'll appear larger uh, than things that are closer to the equator. But it's a good projection to use if you're going to use other parts of the world. So in this case, since I'm using North America only, I'm going to use the conic projection. And then when I'm ready, I'll click OK. So then it inserts the borders and then basically zooms out to show the whole uh, region of everything that I just inserted. I can also go back in there and what I'm going to do is I'm going to auto insert county borders just for the state of Illinois since most of what we're going to be drawing uh, is in Illinois as well. So from this list I can select Illinois and on border types I'm going to choose county. And I'm going to go back to the options tab and I'm going to change the thickness uh, down to 1 and the line color to gray. That'll make the county borders uh, seem a little bit less emphasized than the state borders. So then I'll click OK and it draws in the county borders for Illinois. At this point then I can kind of zoom in. I'll go up to the one lines tab and then to the zoom on area icon and then I'm just going to pick our region in central Illinois like so to zoom in on. The slides also show some examples of one line diagrams with built in borders. Here's one with the United States counties drawn in along with other North American borders. And then here's an example of the entire world inserted on a Mercator projection. The next thing we'll do is we'll start adding buses and other objects to our one line diagram. Back in Simulator, if I go to my Draw tab and then select Network and then Bus off the ribbon, then I'm ready to start drawing buses on my one line diagram. I'm going to click in this region right here on my one line diagram which actually represents Macon County, Illinois. I don't worry about being exact as far as where I play, place the buses on the one line diagram. Uh, we can move them around later and we'll do other things to edit. So when I'm ready to place the bus on the diagram I just click where I want it and then it brings up this menu right here. And we're going to start with the 138 KV ADM North bus. And that was bus number 32353. I can just type that in right here and then click the Find by Number button. And then it'll jump to that bus. And it shows me all the information about that bus in this dialog right here. And again, similarly to how we, we inserted buses in the previous session, we can change things like the orientation, the shape, and the size of, of the new bus. Uh, basically, it's just going to follow our default drawing values. So when I'm ready to insert it, I'll just click OK, and it places the object on the one line diagram. I'm going to zoom in using my shift, my uh, control key and my up arrow. And then also I can use the page up and page down to zoom in. So keep zooming down to a level 
where you can read the text. And then repeat the insertion procedure by selecting Network and then Bus from the Draw ribbon. And click in the background and the other two buses that we're going to insert are going to be 32370. So we'll enter that and then click Find My Number. Then click OK. Then back to the network and then bus. Then click in the background. 32371. and click OK. So these are all basically 138 kV buses in the Decatur, Illinois area. Uh, we've got ADM, which is the big uh, grain processing company, Caterpillar, and it looks like uh, Ferries Park, which I think is a load bus. At this point, let's go ahead and save our case to the PWB format and also our one-line diagram go up to the application button and click it and then we're going to say save the case as and then save it to a PWB format and we'll just leave the name as it is midwest.pwb and then I'll click save and then it's also going to prompt me for a file name for the display that's the one line diagram and I'll just go ahead and select the name Midwest for that as well and then click Save. And then once it saves it, it puts the title of the one-line diagram in the one-line window here. The next thing we want to do is insert transmission lines onto our diagram. One easy way to do this is with the auto insert option on the draw ribbon. When we do this, lines between buses that are already drawn on the uh, one line diagram will be automatically drawn. We can also draw the lines manually, uh, much as we did in the previous training session as well. But the automatic line insertion is certainly a handy utility. So from the draw ribbon, we'll go to the auto insert and then we will choose lines. Here it gives me a few options. I can choose a minimum KV level, so if I've got a lot of low voltage buses on the, on the diagram, but don't necessarily want to clutter it up with low voltage transmission lines, I can put a minimum level in there as well. I can optionally choose to insert the text fields that go with the transmission lines whether or not to ins insert uh, equivalent transmission lines. And then there's some options uh, as far as how to display multi-section lines and whether or not we want to show a pie chart for, uh, for bus ties or, or for lines that have no limits, no, no uh, thermal MVA limits entered. And then down here you can specify how uh, bus ties are defined, basically low impedance branches. I'm going to go ahead and just leave all the defaults and then click OK. And we can see it inserted the transmission lines between the buses as shown here. If your diagram doesn't look exactly like this, it's just going to be because the default drawing values may be a little bit different. Uh, say the pie charts uh, may be a different size or the circuit breakers might be specified as a different size. And of course you can go in to the default drawing values and change those if you like. And recall from the previous session that the default drawing values are shown on the one lines ribbon. So again I can click that and if I want to make any edits here I can do that. I can also automatically insert other objects as well, such as generators, loads, switch shunts, 
or there's an option to automatically insert basically everything that could be connected to the buses, lines, generators, loads, and shunts. For right now I'm just going to select auto insert loads and similar to the dialog on the lines I can pick a minimum KV level and I've got a couple other options as well. I'm just going to select OK and then here it automatically inserted the loads that were attached to each of those three buses. And recall there are different ways that I can pan and zoom to navigate on this one line. If I choose the one lines tab then I can see the ribbon has got several different ways for zooming. I can select a certain percentage zoom level to jump to. I've got the area that I can zoom in on. I can zoom in a single step just by clicking on the diagram with this selected or I can zoom with the keyboard shortcuts. If I hold down the control button then I can use page up or page down or the up and down arrows. I can also pan with the arrows as well. And if I deselect uh, the zoom tools then I can also just click on the background to pan around as well. I'm not actually moving any of the objects by doing this, but rather I'm moving the whole diagram. In addition to typing in the numbers of the individual buses that we want to put on the one line diagram, there's also a tool called the bus palette, which makes it really easy to just drag and drop buses from the palette to the one line diagram. Back in Simulator, if I select the Draw tab and then the Show Insert Palette for and then Buses, it will bring up the palette. The palette's got four different panes. The first one shows every bus that is on the diagram already. These are the displayed buses. If I pick a displayed bus, such as the Caterpillar bus, it will show me that bus's displayed neighbors. Those are the buses that are already on the diagram, as well as its undisplayed neighbors. So this provides a really easy way to kind of build out a diagram from one starting point and pick up the rest of the topology that's kind of in that neighborhood. So if I select uh, an undisplayed neighbor, for example, I can just drag it onto the diagram near where Caterpillar is and it will put it on there. I can basically repeat that also for the undisplayed neighbor of the Ferries Park bus as well. If I click on 32371 in the displayed column, I can then find its undisplayed neighbor, the Mount Zion bus and drag it below the Ferries Park bus. Now you'll notice in this case after I automatically inserted the buses from the pallet it drew loads and the transmission lines as well. That's an option which you can access under this options menu. If I click on that I can see uh, that there's a checkbox here for auto inserting lines, gens, loads, and shunts. If I don't want it to do that, I can just clear that checkbox. And then I'll also have to go back in here and make sure that this option, auto insert lines after each insertion, is dechecked if I in fact want it that way. It was grayed out when I had selected the auto insert lines, gens, loads, and shunts. So I'll go ahead and restore that. And then if I want, I can move objects around to sort of clean up the appearance of the diagram. I can drag this bus, uh, maybe move the text around, maybe change where the load is coming in, kind of stretch the bus out a little bit 
and so forth. Skipping ahead a few slides, we can see there's also an option in there to, on the zoom ribbon, to show the entire extents of the one line diagram. And that's called the show full button on the toolbar. If I switch back over to simulator and then go to the one lines tab, I can click show full. Now go ahead and close my bus palette here and it'll jump out and show the entire extents. Of course this was the region that I was zoomed in on before. We can also add background lines and other objects to the one line diagram as we had also discussed in the previous training session. So for example a background line might be used if we want to draw in a small lake that's not automatically shown on the, uh, the set of borders, the state borders. So on my one line diagram I could use it to draw uh, say Clinton Lake like this which is located uh, near Decatur. So if I switch back over to simulator and then again use the control key the, the zooming shortcuts and the panning shortcuts to zoom in on this area. Then I can go back to my draw ribbon, then click the background tab, and then say a background line. Now drawing a background line is very similar to drawing a transmission line in that you just click wherever you want a vertex to appear. It's generally not a good idea to click and drag while you're drawing the background lines. If you do so, you know, it'll create a, a smooth line like that, but it'll also put in a whole bunch of vertices. Then when you're ready to finish the line, you can just go back to where you started and then double click. Once I have that object on the diagram, I can go to my format buttons, uh, for example, and put in a background fill. So I can select the Use Background Fill from the Line Fill tab and then I can make it blue if I want, for example. At this point, let's go ahead and save our case again. I can easily do that from the Quick Access Toolbar as well, just by clicking on the Save Case icon. And then let's switch over to run mode. Click the run mode button and I'm going to zoom in on this diagram a little bit more so I can see the flows a little bit better. I can see that it's showing the flows on the transmission lines and the loads that I've put on my one line diagram. And I'm going to choose the tools ribbon and then I'm going to show my message log here and from the tools ribbon I can actually play the simulation which will repeatedly solve the case and then show the flows animating as well and I can interact with the one line diagram that I've created and as it's solving the case, as it's playing the animation, it will resolve if any actions are taken uh, for the new power system. So for example, I could open this line between ADM North and Ferries Park by clicking on the circuit breaker. The line's taken out of service and I can see in my log that it has to recalculate the power flow because of the mismatch caused by that line being opened. Once it does that, it can then continue to solve and animate the power flow case. So I'll go ahead and click the stop button also from the tools ribbon. 
and it will stop animating the flows and solving the power flow case. And again, it's important to note that even though we had only a few objects on our one line diagram, simulator was actually simulating the entire 10,452 bus case. Next, we will explore the one line local menu. And this can be accessed by right clicking on an empty portion of the one line display. If you actually right click on an object, then it'll bring up a local menu that is pertinent to that object. But if you right click on a blank portion, then you'll access the one line local menu. And there's several different options that are available from the one line local menu, which we'll explore at this time. Uh, certain things that you can do include printing the one line, exporting the screen to a bitmap or a JPEG file, uh, or you can save it to other formats, or you can apply uh, one line templates, and there's many, many more options, which again, we will explore at this time. So other options include things like finding buses on the one line, panning and zooming controls, and so forth. Uh, displaying other dialogues, screen layers, contouring, difference flows, uh, which we'll talk about later. Back in simulator, I'm going to go ahead and close the message log to get it out of the way. And again, if I right click anywhere on the background of the one line diagram, I can bring up this local menu. So we're going to talk about most of these options in the slides that follow. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the one line display options, the second item on the list here. And we can see it's got several different categories or pages that are shown here on the left. And as I click on those, I can switch the view that's shown on the right. So there's animated flows, display object options, display options, geography and coordinates, the grid and the highlight unlinked objects, a memo for the one line, pie charts and gauges, substations, and the thumbnail view. Well, we talked about some of these options in the previous section, but we're going to go over them in a little bit more detail in this session. The display options category has several different uh, toggles and checkboxes for deciding what to display and how to display it. So you can do things like changing the background color, which by default here is white. If I want to change to a different color, I can click the button and choose a color from the palette. I can also determine whether or not I want to show things like absolute values for megawatt flows, uh, which by default is chosen. Usually the arrows on the one line diagram will indicate then which direction the megawatts are flowing. You can also do the same for megavars if you like. Uh, by default the megavars aren't shown, the, the arrows are not shown for the megavars so this box is also not checked because then the sign indicates whether the flow is going into or out of a bus. And then you can do the same thing for interface flows, uh, mouse wheel zooming, which we looked at a little bit in a prior section. Uh, one line hints, this is if you float the mouse uh, over an object, then it'll give you a hint uh, regarding that object. And you can do things for highlighting or visualizing elements that are out of service. Like, for example, if a generator is disconnected, uh, you can automatically draw an X through the generator on the one line diagram. Uh, use dash lines to show transmission lines that are out of service, for example. Or you can have things blink uh, if they're out of service as well. Then you can also enter path names for, uh, for one line diagrams and where they can be found. Now, by default, simulator is going to look in the case directory to find the one line diagram. But if you want to keep one line diagrams in a central place, for example, 
you could enter directories here then by clicking on the browse button and then finding certain directories uh, in this uh, this browse window and then you can specify them so that if simulator needs to open a particular one line diagram and it can't be found in the same directory as the case file or the PWB then it'll search in those locations for the one line diagram. And then of course this dialog like most dialogs in simulator has a help button which you can click to bring up context sensitive help. So we can see we have the help page for the one line display options dialog and from there I can click, click on specific topics to get more information. The Display Object Options page shows certain options for specific object types, like generators, loads, and switch shunts. You can tell it, for example, to display the circuit breakers for all those objects or only for specific objects. The generators by default have rotors that are shown inside the generator. I don't have a good example right here to show. Uh, but you can recall from our bus view one line earlier that it would automatically uh, put the generator objects on there and it would show the rotor inside. You can tell it uh, as it's refreshing the simulation if you're playing the simulation to actually have the generator rotor rotate if you like. And then there are certain options as well uh, for multi-section lines and bus fields. Uh, as well. Then there's also a tab that pertains specifically to circuit breakers where you can specify what color to show and whether or not to fill the box inside the circuit breaker if the circuit breaker is open or closed. And of course you can have different settings then for breakers that are designated normally closed versus those that are designated normally open and you can change the shape of the breaker if you want as well. Moving back to the display options page, there's a display detail section right here where you can specify exactly through a, a filter mechanism what to show on your one line diagram. Now by default it's set to complete. There's also a couple other presets like moderate and minimal which include uh, certain predefined objects which they're going to show. Or you can use a custom filter to determine what gets shown on the diagram. To activate that you can click the set button and it'll bring up this dialog which is going to show uh, different drawing objects and then you can filter it uh, by telling it which objects to show and then also which areas, zones, voltage levels, and screen layers to show as well and basically all these things, all these options that are shown here uh, on the right with the exception of the voltage can also be accessed through these tabs across the top. So for example if I only wanted to show buses on my diagram I could say I want to show all bus objects. Uh, if I want I could put in a, uh, a voltage range as well and when I finish making my selection, I can choose OK. Uh, for certain things also, you can access an advanced filter and apply the advanced filter to those buses as well, or to those objects as well. And you can access that by double clicking. And then that brings up the advanced filter. And so with the advanced filter, then you can pick specific uh, conditions and set those and when you're finished making your selection you can click the OK button and I could call it buses for example and then click OK it's got the custom display field if I click OK again it's only going to show the buses and the bus objects uh, like the fields
And then of course to switch back to the complete view, I can right click to bring up the one line display options. And then choose complete detail and click OK. And that display, uh, custom display set, it's also worth noting that that only applies when you're in run mode. Uh, if you switch to edit mode, it will show everything. And that's to keep you from getting confused. Uh, if you draw something on the diagram in edit mode and that object that you add does not meet the filter, then it would immediately disappear, which would be very confusing. Uh, of course, in run mode, you don't expect to be adding or deleting objects from the one line diagram. So it's a little bit more straightforward there. This slide describes uh, what is shown on some of the preset display detail. So if you were to choose moderate instead of uh, the custom one, which we did in the example, it would remove pie charts and line fields. Uh, the minimal selection would remove pie charts in all fields except those associated with generators, loads, or shunts. And a couple other options on the dialog, which we didn't specifically cover uh, in the example are this box which says group by object type. With that selected, then uh, what you see up here is uh, things like all bus objects, um, all area objects, all background objects, etc. If you decheck that, then it will show individual items for the buses themselves, uh, for the bus fields, and so forth. You can also check or decheck uh, this option right here which says to only show the objects in the display or already selected. So if you don't have any area objects on your display for example it's not going to show this item that says all area objects if you've got this box checked. It's only going to show up here the objects which are actually on your diagram or objects that are selected if you are using this as a filter for things that are already selected. And then a couple other options that are at the bottom. You can use this criteria dialog as kind of a not filter, uh, basically to select things that you don't want, uh, don't want shown. Uh, then you would check this box right here. The one line display dialog also has options for determining how pie charts display, uh, the pie charts that are shown on lines, transformers, or interfaces. And to get to that, we'll go reopen the One Line Display Options dialog and select the pie charts and gauges. This dialog is organized by tabs according to the different object types that you can have for pie charts and gauges. So for lines, we have the option of selecting pie charts that depict um, the limit as a amp limit or for transformers uh, MVA. You can also show the pie chart as a, uh, a share of the MVA limit which is the total power option, the real power or megawatts, reactive power, or the maximum percentage of loading under contingency for use with contingency analysis or the PTDF, the power transfer distribution factor, uh, which will be talked about more in a later section. The same options are also available for gauges, which can also be added to the one line diagram from the one line ribbon tab. The group of tabs below are used to specify how the different pie charts and gauges appear, uh, what colors they are under normal conditions, and then how they appear under certain limiting conditions or warning conditions. What the values are showing right now is that at 80% of the limit on the line, the value in uh, the actual percentage uh, of flow that's being used will be displayed as a number inside the pie chart. The normal size scalar is a multiplier uh, against which the size of the pie chart is multiplied. So you can have the pie chart change sizes under certain conditions uh, as shown right here that if the uh, 
this particular level of 80% is reached or exceeded, then the uh, pie chart will increase in size to 1.5 times its normal size and the color will change to orange. Uh, at 100% it'll change to two times its size and the color will change to red. So you can change these colors if you want to just by clicking on them and selecting a color from the palette. And we can change the numbers uh, just to see kind of what the effect is. If we drop the value in the show value percent to 50 and then for the lines let's also change this uh, percentage from 80. We'll just click in it and then type in 50 and then uh, the warning percent, let's change that to 60 and then we'll click OK and we can see on our one line diagram now that lines that are carrying at least 50 percent of their limit are shown in orange. If I go ahead and reopen the dialog and then go back to the pie charts and gauges, another thing I can see if I want to add additional points to the warning limit scalers and colors, I can just right click anywhere in the grid and select insert. And then I can put in a new percentage, a new scalar, and a new color. And it's shown as you can see here. If I want to get rid of one that's already in there, I can just right click and then delete it. So this tab shows how the MVA pie charts will appear and I also have similar options for megawatt, megavars, amps, and so forth. And along the top I can change the display of pie charts and gauges for interfaces and then there's also a tab for modifying the styles of pie charts and gauges and then I can take those styles and apply them. And these styles apply to object types other than lines and interfaces like for generators, load tab changing transformers, and switch shunts. And then there are some other uh, options underneath the general options tab as well for controlling how the pie charts and the gauges uh, change size you can also set the background color from here and a couple other options as well. And the slides also depict the dialog and its various components. So here's the bottom section where you can switch from the MVA to the various other quantities that can be shown. And then the last tab on the right shows special options for formatting lines that are open or out of service. And then the general options tab shows how different text values are displayed along with the pie charts and the gauges and again how they're, they change uh, when you zoom you could set a maximum zoom level such that if you zoom down beyond that level it won't continue to resize the pie chart and make it bigger and bigger. And an important note with these options too is they only apply to the line and interface pie charts and gauges. So the other styles for the other objects are governed on the pie chart gauge, gauge styles tab. In addition a lot of the quantities that are shown inside that dialog for the pie charts and the gauges can be accessed from the ribbon as well. So if I close the dialog and select the options tab from the ribbon then there's a pie chart drop down that shows a lot of those quantities and in some cases it may be quicker to access and edit the values from the drop down than it is to go back into the dialog. Uh, it's also partially a matter of personal preference as well, whether you like to go into the dialog or just use these drop down options. And the slide here depicts a certain set of values for the pie charts, uh, as well as the one line background, which is set to yellow, the warning percentage, 
is orange, or the warning color is orange, and the percentage is 60. So anything above 60 will show up as orange. And then uh, the next limit is set at 70 with a color of red and a scalar of 2. So background is also set to white here. Normal color is set to blue. And the value is shown inside the pi for anything greater than 45. Back to simulator, the next thing we're going to look at on the one-line display options are the animated flows. And in addition to right-clicking to bring up the local menu, of course, you can also bring up the one-line display options uh, from the options tab. I think it's also on the one-lines tab as well. So again, this is just a matter of personal preference, uh, and sometimes it's more convenient to use one option or the other. So in the dialog, I'll then select the animated flows sub-tab. And this allows you to change the characteristics of the arrows that depict the flows on lines and other objects. So you can globally determine whether or not you even want to show the arrows uh, or whatever symbol is being used to animate. And then you can determine which objects that you wish to show the flows on. You can select what quantity you want the flows to depict. So be it megawatts, megavars, both megawatts and megavars, uh, PTDFs, which again will be discussed later, uh, actual megawatts and PTDFs simultaneously, or you can base it on a custom floating point field, which is one that you can populate with any number that you want. You can choose whether or not you want the flow arrows to actually move or animate as the simulation is being played. Uh, if so, then you can scale the speed of the flow so that the arrows actually move faster if the quantity that they're representing is bigger and then also the size of the flow so you can have the arrows be proportional to the quantity that's being depicted proportional in size this next section allows you to specify a reference size level for the arrows and then a density so how closely uh, packed together the arrows are at the reference level and then you can specify kind of a nominal or reference level. So in this case, uh, the maximum line flow is listed as 300. So at 300 megawatts, then the size of the symbol will be 10 and the density will be 10 as well. Um, a lot of these options, you can kind of determine the best setting by playing with them quite a bit. But what I find is particularly useful is to first click this button right here, which says to set the size, density, and the reference value at a level that's reasonable for the one line that's active. And you can select that and then come back and if there's anything that you want to change, uh, you can change those specific values. So I'll go ahead and select that and then click OK. And then the size and the reference values have been set automatically based on this one line so that everything kind of looks nice. But again, if I want to make them larger or I want to make increase the density or decrease the density, I can go back into the menu and just change the numbers. But here I can see, you know, I've got a certain amount of flow on this line, a certain amount of flow going into this load. Uh, this is 133 megawatts. It's shown at this size. And I can kind of see what 53 megawatts looks like right here. So if I go back into that dialog and then go back to the animated flows, uh, we'll just take a look at a couple of the other options that are available here. You can change the shape from arrows to a couple other options, circles, squares, or triangles. You can change the, the rate of animation or the reference rate of animation, make it slower or faster. And then you can also change colors for the various quantity types uh, as well. The slides also show here a description of the various parts of that dialog. And then this slide right here gives a detailed mathematical representation of what the arrow size and the arrow spacing uh, relative to the density, what all that means. Um, again, determining what looks right for your diagram is often just a matter of trial and error. Uh, but if you're interested in the details, they are shown here. 
This slide depicts the 7 bus 1 line diagram with the uh, size animation checkbox being set to true. So the size of the arrows is proportional uh, to the megawatt flow and then the reference size is set as 200. So 200 is basically uh, whatever that reference size is and anything that's smaller than 200 uh, shows up as a smaller arrow. Anything larger would show up larger. And there's also a ribbon for accessing the same parameters that you can see in the dialog. Again, it's on the options uh, tab, just like the pie charts were. Uh, and there's one for animation. And there's several other options that you can also bring up in a similar manner. Uh, but basically, it, it's a matter of personal preference again. And in some cases, you might prefer to use one or the other option. The next one line feature that we'll look, look at is the thumbnail view and that can also be accessed from the one line display options menu. If I switch back over here I can click on thumbnail view and the first option is just whether or not to show the thumbnail view and I'll go ahead and select OK so that we can see what that does. It basically provides another view of the one line but it's zoomed out to show kind of a bigger picture so I'm looking at more of a central Illinois right here and then the box in the middle shows what's actually in my larger display. So I can click in here and then drag to kind of navigate around and I can see where I'm at, kind of the big picture. And if I go back to the display options and then choose thumbnail view again, I can change some of these parameters. So the size of the thumbnail as a percentage of the window size uh, is set to 25%. That's actually 25% in the vertical and the horizontal dimension. So it occupies you know, one-fourth of the height and one-fourth of the width in this case. Uh, and then you can select a, a multiplier by which the thumbnail zoom is relative to the diagram or you can set it to a specified level instead. You can change the location, the border, uh, the background color. If you want to change that to make it stand out a little bit, you can do that. Uh, and of course, once you make changes, you can just click Apply down here as well just to see what it does. Uh, and if you like it, then you can click OK. The slide here depicts an example of the thumbnail on a larger case. And we can see uh, that we're showing part of the TVA system here. Uh, and we're zoomed in on this uh, little area. It looks like around Nashville, Tennessee. And then the thumbnail shows the larger geographic view. And the thumbnail options also can be accessed from that options ribbon bar. So you can change whether or not to show the thumbnail and then the numerical settings as well, just like you can on the dialog. Simulator also allows you to save views associated with the one-line diagram, which are really handy for navigating. Uh, you can recall a certain location, a zoom level, and even screen layers that are active in a certain view. And then if you navigate off that view to a different part of the diagram, you can quickly return to it just by recalling the view. So in Simulator, I can select the one-lines tab on the ribbon and then there's this option for saving the view and I can click on that and it shows presently I have no views defined but if I want to save this as a view I just click save view and it opens up and populates the dialog with the XY coordinates that I'm presently at right now. If I want to change those to some other value I can do that but of course it's easier to first find the view usually um, and then let it automatically populate these values. And if you want, you can tell it to save uh, the, the layers that are presently hidden can be stored with the view so that when you come back to the view later, those same layers are hidden and the other layers are shown. Uh, in this case, I don't have uh, any layers hidden, so it's not shown anything right there. Um, and the contouring information, which we'll take a look at in a different 
training session uh, can also be saved with the view so that when you recall the view the same contour is redisplayed. So if I like these settings I can just click OK or rather I'll click Save first to give it a name and I'm going to give this name I'm going to call it uh, Decatur and then check OK and then I can check OK again. Now that view is stored with the one line. I can go to my one line and let's say uh, zoom out with the control keys and I can pan, you know, move to a completely different area and then to jump back to that Decatur view is very easy now. I can just click the Save View button and then choose Decatur and it jumps back uh, right to where I was. So it's very handy for navigating if there are certain uh, views that you use very commonly uh, you can easily jump back to them. The next option on the local menu that we're going to take a look at is the find buses on one lines. And if I switch back over to simulator and I right click to bring up the local menu I can see in addition to the one line display options that we just looked at there is an option for finding objects on the one line. And if I select that it will give me uh, different object types that I can browse for. And then over on the right it will list the objects of that type that are shown in my diagram. So I can select a particular bus and similar to what we saw when we were inserting the buses uh, I can sort it by name, sort it by number, uh, I can start to type in a number like 3236 and it'll jump to the next match in the list and I can use wildcards uh, just like I can on uh, with, with the insertion uh, dialog. When I find the bus that I want to zoom to I can just click OK and then basically what that does is it centers the diagram on that bus. You can also tell it to auto zoom when panning which will have it zoom in to a, uh, a level at uh, 100 percent basically with that object in the center. Uh, if you don't want it to do that then you can deselect it. If you've got large diagrams uh, you, you may or may not want to you may not want to check uh, these boxes because it will kind of slow down the process of finding the object, but in this case it's pretty harmless. Uh, the auto updating will basically just keep zooming to a, a successive, you know, as you as you select different buses or as you type in uh, different numbers, it'll actually change the zoom in the background. If you don't want it to do that, then you can decheck that, and it'll still zoom to the bus that you select at the, when you when you hit OK. It'll jump to that bus. So now I've zoomed in on this North 27th bus. Um, so that's very handy, of course, if you have many, many buses on your one-line diagram and you want to quickly uh, change the focus of the one-line to a bus of interest. It's worth pointing out at this point, too, if I right-click to bring up the local menu, there are several other options uh, which are seen on here, some of which we'll cover in other training sessions, uh, some of which are pretty self-explanatory, too. Uh, you can print things you can copy the image to the clipboard, you can export it to a file which will give you options like bitmap or JPEG, Windows made a file. Um, you can access the views that we just looked at from here as well. Uh, you, I can go to a view that I've already created uh, and so forth. So again many of these will be we'll, we'll take a look at uh, in different training sessions. One powerful feature of Simulator is the ability to use one-line diagrams with multiple cases, uh, which is really great because you can spend uh, some effort then building one-line diagrams and then as the case gets updated over time, uh, a new addition to the case becomes available. You can still reuse your existing one-line. Of course, there may be some changes to the underlying case. Um, bus numbering, for example, might change uh, the actual topology of the system might change, new transmission lines might be added, 
and in the process uh, old transmission lines that referenced old connections between certain pairs of buses might not be uh, valid anymore. Um, and this does require a little bit of attention uh, from the user to make sure that the diagram is still up to date. So the next few slides basically describe a few options that you have when changes are made to the underlying case as far as keeping your diagram current. I'm not going to go through detailed examples of each of the processes that are shown here, but rather the slides are just provided for a reference uh, in case you need to deal with this issue. So one thing that you can do is first just get a list of objects that are no longer linked up between the one line and the case. Uh, basically, if there is a, say, a bus in the system which points to a certain bus number, say, you know, bus 45. And then in your new case, bus 45 doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's changed to a different number or it's been replaced with an entirely new topology. Uh, then that object on the one line that used to refer to bus 45 is going to become what we call an unlinked object. Um, it's just an object on the diagram, but it doesn't have any analog that it represents in the power flow case. So when you open your new power system case, uh, you can go to the application button and then open your one line diagram that you created with an old case. And to find out if the elements on the one line still match up with the new case, you go to the one lines tab on the ribbon and then list uh, the display and then point to the unlinked display objects. So here in simulator I would go to the one lines, list display, and then unlinked display objects. In this case I don't have any because I just created this diagram specifically for this case. Now if you do have a few unlinked objects, uh, say 500 or less, um, it might be easiest just to delete them all and then fix up the parts of the one line diagram uh, that are affected by the unlinked objects and you know more specifically the parts of the diagram that you really care about. In this example uh, there's a bus 101 let's say it's on the one line diagram here but then in your new case it no longer exists. If that were to happen there would be 17 unlinked objects because not only would you have the bus but you'd have the load that's attached to it and the transmission lines that are attached to it and then all the objects associated with each of those like the field that points to the bus, uh, the load fields, the pie charts and the line fields, the circuit breakers would all become unlinked. So if that were the case the simplest thing to do might be just to delete it and the dialog provides an easy way to do that. You can just click on the box that says to delete the unlinked objects right here. However, if there are really a lot of objects that become unlinked, then you might want to consider a couple other options. And basically, Simulator includes a couple of different tools whereby you can try to renumber the buses based on the bus name and the nominal KV. So the procedure to do that is basically shown on this slide right here. Uh, you first open the old one line in the old case. This is uh, basically the set that should be completely linked up. And then in the edit mode you can go to the tools tab and then from the ribbon select renumber and then renumber buses. And again, I'll switch to edit mode and then go to the renumber and then renumber buses. And then if I'm interested in basically just renumbering the one line, I can set this up by telling it to load only the buses on the one line and then clicking set up the bus swap list. 
then from here I see the five buses that are on my one line diagram I can right click in this grid and then tell it to save as and then choose auxiliary file and then I can give it a name like old scheme and then click save and then from here I can close that dialog and then the next thing I want to do is open the new case or the, the new edition uh, of that case that I was looking on that has the new bus numbering scheme and then open the one, old one line then I can go back to the tools renumber and the renumber buses basically open that same dialog and then tell it that I want to freshen the current one line and then when the file dialog pops up then I'll select the auxiliary file that I just saved uh, old scheme .aux or whatever you chose to name it and then click the setup swap list button then what simulator will automatically do is match the old numbering scheme to the new one line basically by using the bus name and the na nominal KV. And we'll talk about key fields a little bit in a later training session uh, but basically there's nothing inside simulator or really in any PowerFlow uh, program such as PSSE or PSLF that guarantees that the combination of the bus name and the nominal KV will be unique. So this is really just a heuristic. It's really just guessing um, using the assumption that the bus names and the nominal KVs won't change. Uh, in the case that there are more than one bus that, I, that has the same name and nominal KV, then what Simulator will try to do is select uh, or match up buses between the case and the one line where the area name of the bus are the same and if simulator can't figure it out still it'll put in both options in the swap list and then you can go through the swap list and manually toggle uh, whether or not to swap the old number with the new number so that's really what's shown on this slide is you'll have to go through the list manually and make sure you want to swap things that are listed and you can change the value of that swap field from yes to no uh, you can toggle it by double clicking or you can just select a cell that you want to change and then type in yes or no and then hit enter. And then when you're done you can select uh, the change bus numbers option at the bottom of the form. And one word of caution if you do have a large one line then this process may take some time. Another thing you can do is you can tell simulator to, ac simulator to actually open a one line diagram or a PWD file using the name and nominal KV. Uh, this basically per performs that process on the fly and to do this you would open the one line using the name and nominal KV. So if I had a one line I could go to the application button and then tell it to open the one line and at the bottom here where it says files of type instead of just the one line display file I could select the one line display file with the name and nominal KV linking and then when I select a, a display file then it would bring it in linking the buses using the name and nominal KV instead of the number which is the normal default so I'm just going to go ahead and cancel out of here and just also a word of caution with this process is this will automatically renumber the diagram and if the name and nominal KVs are not unique then it can cause some errors also available through a subscription service from our affiliate uh, Energy Visuals are a series of geographic based one line diagrams that are based on the FERC 715 filings uh, that each of the NERC regions make and these are updated annually so as each new series comes out with the FERC 715 filings um, we basically take care of or Energy Visuals takes care of uh, making sure that the diagrams are up to date they take care of the bus renumbering so that can be a very convenient option and the contact information is listed here Tim Bourne is the sales contact 
and also available from Energy Visuals are generator cost models which can be used with the Power World Simulator Optimal Power Flow, uh, which will be discussed more in a different session. So this concludes this training session and thank you for joining us. If you need further assistance, please feel free to look us up on the web, give us a call, send email to our support line, or if you prefer to work with a particular Power World engineer, please feel free to contact that person directly.